Moving on to chapter 11, we'll cover the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, and K. And what you'll see is that they vary not only in structure, but also in functions. Fat soluble vitamins are found in the fatty portions or the oily portions of food. Whereas if you recall, water soluble vitamins are found in the watery components in food as well as within the body. Fat soluble vitamins are insoluble in water. So therefore for them to be digested, bile, the emulsifying agent is required. Fat soluble vitamins are then transported on chylomicrons. Again, if you recall that specific lipoprotein which the body makes to transport fat soluble nutrients. They first will enter the lymphatic system before eventually entering into the bloodstream. Fat soluble vitamins can be stored in the body to a large extent. So because of that, there is a much greater risk of toxicity and a decreased risk of deficiency with vitamins A, D, E, and K. The first fat soluble vitamin that we'll review is vitamin A. Vitamin A is the first fat soluble vitamin that was discovered by scientists identifying three active forms. There is the retinol form, which is the alcohol form. There is the retinal form, which is the aldehyde form. There is the retinoic acid form, which is the acid form. Then there's another compound to note. This is beta carotene. Beta carotene is a precursor, which is only found in plants. When we consume beta carotene, the body can take this specific precursor and turn it into a form of active vitamin A. The first function of vitamin A to know is its role in vision. And the form that is necessary for us to be able to see is the retinal form, the aldehyde form. Vitamin A in this form helps to maintain the cells of the cornea as well as participates in the conversion of light energy into nerve impulses, thus allowing us to see. The retina contains certain pigments, one being rhodopsin, which is required for us to be able to respond to dim light or faint light situations. Another pigment found in the cells of the retina, which allows us to respond to bright light as well as color vision, is known as idopsin. Putting the necessity of vitamin A requirement into somewhat of a perspective, consider that the millions of photosensitive cells in the retina require millions of vitamin A containing pigments for us to be able to see. Although vitamin A is critical for its role in vision, the eye, or specifically the retina, only contains about one one thousandth of the body's vitamin A. Much greater amounts are found in the cell lining of our body surfaces. Here, vitamin A is necessary to participate in protein synthesis as well as a process known as cell differentiation. The form which is necessary for these processes is the acid form, or specifically retinoic acid. When considering our body surfaces, the major component are known as epithelial cells. The epithelial cells on the outside of our body form our skin. The epithelial cells or tissues that line the inside of the body are referred to as our mucous membranes. So these are the linings of the mouth, stomach, intestines, lungs, bladder, vagina, uterus, eyelids, as well as our sinuses. The major function of these mucous membranes is to protect us, to protect us from damage from the sun, exposure to microorganisms, harmful substances, and overall to decrease our chance of infection. Here you can see how important vitamin A is to help maintain mucous membranes to keep them intact and functioning. Without adequate amounts of vitamin A, the structure and function of the cells is impaired, which in turn then compromises the effectiveness of the mucous membranes in being able to provide a defense against microorganisms as well as other types of foreign invaders.
Vitamin A is also necessary for reproduction and growth. Here we're talking about the retinol form, the alcohol form of vitamin A. In men, this form of the vitamin is necessary for sperm development. In women, it's necessary for fetal development during pregnancy. Growth in children, most specifically bone growth, also requires vitamin A. Bone growth involves a complex sequence of events which includes cells that are known as osteoclasts, osteoblasts, as well as specific enzymes. Again, this process requires adequate amounts of vitamin A. Those were some functions of active vitamin A, the retinol, the retinal, as well as the retinoic forms. But what about beta carotene, which I had mentioned previously as being a precursor, meaning that your body can take it and actually turn it into vitamin A. Well, beta carotene, besides its ability to be this precursor, can also function as an antioxidant. And if you recall in chapter 10, we discussed antioxidants when vitamin C was reviewed. An antioxidant is a substance within the body that protects our cells and tissues from damage that free radicals can inflict. And those free radicals are those unstable molecules that have unpaired electrons, which can damage, again, cells and tissues within the body. So beta carotene has been identified as being able to protect against them. Because of its ability to function as an antioxidant, it may potentially help to protect us from certain diseases, things like cancer, heart disease, body inflammation, among others. We know vitamin A is important, but what foods can provide us with appropriate amounts? Well, it's important to note that there are two categories of vitamin A within foods. There are those which are only found in animal products, and these are referred to as preformed vitamin A. So rich sources of preformed vitamin A include liver, fish oil, eggs, milk, cheese, among some other sources. The second category is pro-vitamin A, specifically beta carotene, and this is found only in plants. While we usually associate fruits and vegetables that are orange or yellow in color as being rich sources, so you could think carrots, sweet potatoes, apricots, pumpkin as some examples, there are also dark green vegetables that contribute pro-vitamin A or beta carotene. Spinach, kale, broccoli, collard greens are also going to provide us with this pro-vitamin A. The beta carotene, the orange or yellow color, is just simply hidden by the green chlorophyll pigment, which is present in those particular plants. There is an RDA set to ensure adequate consumption. What you'll notice is that the RDA is expressed as a RAE, or a retinol activity equivalent. This takes into account all vitamin A sources, such as those that are coming from both the preformed and the pro-vitamin A sources. As I had mentioned previously, our body stores the fat-soluble vitamins with the liver as the primary site. Because of this storage capability, it would take about one to two years for a deficiency to occur if vitamin A consumption were to become low. The first symptom is usually referred to as night blindness. What happens in this condition is that someone loses their ability to see in dim light or their eyes have a difficult time recovering after a flash of bright light. If it progresses without any type of treatment, the cornea eventually becomes very dry and hard and may progress to permanent blindness, which is referred to as xerophthalmia. While vitamin A deficiency is uncommon in the United States, it is a major issue in developing countries with it being designated as the leading cause of childhood blindness. Besides the eyes being affected by a vitamin A deficiency, the epithelial cells also experience changes. The cells lose their integrity and shape, 
and begin to secrete keratin, a protein which is commonly found in our hair and in our nails. As this keratin production increases, what occurs is a process known as keratinization. Keratinization is the accumulation of keratin in a tissue, which again is associated with this vitamin A deficiency. Less mucus is produced, and this then compromises the GI tract, respiratory tract, urinary tract, everywhere where mucous membranes are located. That in turn then provides less defense against infections. So there can be an increase in respiratory infections, urinary tract infections, ear infections, and so forth. Here's an example of what keratinization may appear as on the surface of the skin. The skin will become very dry, rough, and scaly as lumps of keratin, that specific protein, start to accumulate. Since vitamin A is stored extensively in the body, toxicity may occur. It's more likely to occur, however, if one overconsumes preformed vitamin A coming from fortified foods or supplements. It's less likely, less likely to occur with consumption of large amounts of preformed vitamin A from natural animal products. The results can affect the complex processing of bone cells leading to bone breakdown, osteoporosis, as well as fractures. With pregnancy, if the expectant mother consumes too much vitamin A, abnormal fetal development as well as birth defects can occur. Toxicity symptoms can include blurred vision, nausea, vomiting, vertigo, headaches, head pressure, reduced bone density, as I've already mentioned, as well as liver damage. Because of the potential of toxicity effects, there is an upper level set for adults, and that is 3,000 micrograms of a retinal activity equivalent per day. Remember the other form of vitamin A, beta carotene, or that we refer to as pro-vitamin A? Well, this form is less likely to cause toxicity when it is consumed from food sources but it is stored right under the surface of the skin, which can actually result in the skin developing a yellow or an orangish tinge to it. Beta carotene, however, if overconsumed from supplements, can have toxicity issues. It can destroy active vitamin A, and it can also cause abnormal cell division. There seems to be a greater risk with certain populations that are taking excess amounts of beta carotene from supplements. And that is in smokers, as well as those who consume larger amounts of alcohol. Here you can see the dramatic effect of consuming large amounts of beta carotene from foods. It is stored right under the skin, causing the change in skin color. The next fat soluble vitamin to address is vitamin D. Vitamin D belongs to a family which are known as the calciferols. Whereas vitamin A has three active forms, vitamin D only has one active form in the body. And this is known as 125-dehydroxy vitamin D3. Vitamin D also differs not only from vitamin A, but the other fat soluble vitamins in that the body can synthesize it through adequate sunlight. Because of this, it is not considered, therefore, to be an essential nutrient. Here we can see how vitamin D is synthesized as well as activated. Vitamin D2 is a precursor to active vitamin D, which is found in plant sources. D3 is found in animal sources as well as under the surface of our skin. These two forms are similar and they both go through the same activation process. 
sunlight as well as the addition of hydroxyl groups from the liver and the kidneys fully activate vitamin D for the many body processes it's necessary for. Vitamin D plays a significant role in bone growth and maintenance. Its primary function is to maintain normal serum levels of the minerals calcium and phosphorus, which in turn allow for calcification of the bone, as well as maintaining bone density and bone integrity. It doesn't work alone, however. It's part of a complicated team of other nutrients and hormones, which include vitamin A and vitamin K, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, collagen, as well as the minerals magnesium and fluoride. Other functions of vitamin D that have been identified include that in the brain as well as in the nerve cells, vitamin D protects against cognitive decline. And some studies are even showing that it may play a role in slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease. Vitamin D also has been shown to either enhance or suppress the activity of certain genes that regulate cell growth, specifically in our pancreas, skin, muscles, cartilage, and reproductive organs. Vitamin D has also been found to signal cells of our immune system to defend against some infectious diseases. It specifically is being studied as far as if it can protect us against tuberculosis, body inflammation, multiple sclerosis or MS, as well as the chronic diseases, hypertension, and certain cancers. And then another role or function which has been recently identified is that vitamin D may be necessary to help regulate the cells of our adipose tissue or our fat cells. So there may be a relationship here with the development of obesity. Rich sources of vitamin D include veal, beef, egg yolks, liver, fatty fish, fish oil, fortified milk, fortified milk products, as well as other fortified foods. Then we also have to consider too that sunlight exposure is going to convert the precursor of vitamin D to the active form of vitamin D. As far as recommendations, there is not an RDA set, but we have that adequate intake recommendation being provided. For adults 19 to 70, you could see 15 micrograms per day, but after the age of 70, it goes up to 20 micrograms per day. So why does it increase? Well, with advancing age, our skin, liver, and kidneys lose their capacity to efficiently make and activate vitamin D. Also during this age span, often older adults typically aren't drinking milk or consuming a large amount of milk products. Then finally, this population may also not be spending as much time outdoors. So they're not getting the sunlight exposure to activate the vitamin D under the surface of the skin. For those reasons, that's why the adequate intake is higher for this particular vitamin. Vitamin D deficiency in children can lead to the condition which is known as rickets. Because of inadequate vitamin D, there will be decreased calcium and phosphorus being incorporated into bone. Therefore, bone growth, strength, and density will all be greatly affected. Some of the typical symptoms with rickets include that inadequate calcification of bones, impaired growth, misshapen bones, including often a severe bowing of the legs. There's also enlargement of the ends of the long bones, and it's not uncommon for the rib bones to also experience deformities. In adults, vitamin D deficiency results in a condition known as osteomalacia. In this condition, the bones become soft, flexible, brittle, as well as deformed. Overall density and mass decreases, resulting in weakness as well as pain. This is the condition which is more common, again, in the elderly due to that population often consuming inadequate amounts of vitamin D, as well as decreased exposure to sunlight. 
Now, osteomalacia is not the same as osteoporosis. Remember, osteomalacia is due to a vitamin D deficiency. Osteoporosis, which we will review more closely in Chapter 12 when we cover calcium, is due to a calcium deficiency. Of the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin D is the most likely to have toxic effects when consumed in large amounts. Now, the amounts of vitamin D that are made by the skin as well as found in foods are usually not the issue. The issue is with excessive supplementation where toxic results can occur. And these can include a significant elevation in blood calcium level. This in turn causes calcium to be deposited in soft tissues. So it can be deposited in blood vessels, the kidneys, the heart, lungs, as well as any tissues around our joints. Decreased blood flow can result as well as tissue damage. Because of this potential toxicity um, issue, there is an upper level which has been set and that is 100 micrograms per day. Vitamin E belongs to a family which consists of tocopherols and tocotrienols. All members have a complicated structure with a very long side chain. Even though there are multiple forms within these families, only one is active in the human body, and this is alpha-tocopherol. The main function of vitamin E is an, as an antioxidant. Now, vitamin E, in order to work efficiently needs to have adequate amounts of a certain trace mineral present, which is selenium. And we'll cover selenium in chapter 13. If you recall previously when antioxidants were discussed, vitamin C being one, beta carotene being another, what they do is protect cells and tissues from damage from free radicals. Red blood cells in particular require adequate vitamin E to help keep their membranes intact to retain their integrity and function. Vitamin E, again, as an antioxidant, has been shown to be powerful in helping to protect against the oxidation of LDLs, that's those low density lipoproteins, as well as helping to decrease body inflammation. The result of keeping this in check then is to help decrease the risk of heart disease. Vitamin E is found in many foods and the majority of the vitamin E from our diet comes from vegetable oils or plant oils. So think of things like safflower oil, sunflower oil, canola oil. Those are all gonna be good sources of vitamin E. And then products that are made from vegetable oils. So things like margarine, salad dressings, mayonnaise are also going to contribute vitamin E. Other foods, leafy green vegetables, wheat germ, whole grains, liver, egg yolks, as well as nuts and seeds also contribute a large amount of dietary vitamin E. There is an RDA set for this particular fat-soluble vitamin, and for all adults, it's set at 15 milligrams per day. Vitamin E deficiency from a poor dietary intake in the United States is rare. If it does occur, it's usually more so associated with diseases of fat malabsorption that not only interfere with fat, but also the fat-soluble vitamins. And these can include cystic fibrosis, gallbladder disease, um, inadequate bile production, possibly related to liver disease. If a deficiency does occur, what may result is neuromuscular dysfunction. This is where there would be loss of muscle coordination and reflexes, issues with vision and speech, as well as the potential for nerve damage. Another issue with vitamin E deficiency is what's referred to as red blood cell hemolysis. The red blood cells break and then obviously lose their function, resulting in the symptoms of anemia. Again, it's not very common in our country. However, there is one population which is at a greater risk of this condition. Premature infants may be born before adequate vitamin E transfers from the mother. Therefore, 
the result is an increased risk of this red blood cell hemolysis. For this reason, vitamin E supplements may be given to preemies. Vitamin E is considered to be the least toxic of the four water-soluble vitamins. And even though the liver does store vitamin E, it also has the capability of carefully regulating its own concentrations. There is an upper level, which has been set, however, for adults, and that is 1,000 milligrams per day. Populations which need to take more of a note of this um, upper level are those who are taking anticoagulation medications. What we know is that extremely high doses of vitamin E can interfere directly with blood clotting action of vitamin K. The result in that case can be increased bleeding or hemorrhaging. The last fat soluble vitamin is vitamin K. Vitamin K gets its name from the Danish word coagulation or clotting. So you could see why its main function is going to be involved in the blood clotting process. Vitamin K has been shown to directly be necessary for the synthesis of at least four proteins involved in the clotting process itself. If any of these proteins is not synthesized adequately, the result will be excessive bleeding or hemorrhaging. Another function of vitamin K is that it's involved in synthesizing a bone protein, which is known as osteocalcin. Osteocalcin regulates blood calcium levels, and it is critical in helping to maintain bone density as well as decrease bone turnover or breakdown and protecting against bone breaks as well as fractures. Best food sources of vitamin K include green leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, which would include broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, avocado, kiwi, liver, milk, as well as soybean oil. Similar to vitamin D, Vitamin K also can be obtained from another non-food source. The bacteria in our GI tract can make some vitamin K, although the amount that's actually synthesized is not enough to meet our needs and the bioavailability of what's produced is actually fairly limited. There is a recommendation for vitamin K. However, it is not an RDA. It is, once again, the adequate intake recommendation. And you could see that there's a range anywhere from 90 to 120 micrograms per day. Similar to vitamin E, dietary deficiency of vitamin K is rare. However, there are some conditions which can lead to a vitamin K deficiency and therefore increase the risk of inadequate blood clotting. So what are those conditions or situations? Well, the first to note is with the newborn infant. When they are first born, they have what's referred to as a sterile GI tract. So there's no vitamin K being produced. Breast milk is low in vitamin K, so the risk of bleeding will be increased for this particular population. For that reason, newborns are given a single dose of vitamin K at birth to make sure they have the ability for their blood to clot appropriately. Another situation would be someone who has a disease of fat malabsorption. And I mentioned this previously also with vitamin E, gallbladder disease, cystic fibrosis, um, inadequate bile production. All of those not only decrease fat being absorbed, but it also decreases the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins, in this case, vitamin K. People who are taking long-term antibiotics. Antibiotics not only decrease bad bacteria, they also decrease good bacteria. So those bacteria that are producing vitamin K are going to be significantly decreased. That coupled with the potential of someone not taking in adequate amounts of dietary vitamin K 
can lead to a deficiency and again issues with blood clotting. Vitamin K toxicity is rare and no adverse effects have been reported with higher intakes of this particular fat soluble vitamin. Therefore, there is no upper limit which has been established. High doses, though, of vitamin K can reduce the effectiveness of anticoagulant medications that are used to prevent blood clotting. Therefore, people that are taking these types of medications should try to eat the same amount of vitamin K rich foods daily. Generally, what occurs is their blood clotting proteins are monitored. Their clotting times are also monitored, which then allows drug dosages to be adjusted appropriately to avoid any issues with either excessive coagulation or excessive bleeding.